an old book, a book about witchcraft. You're listening to the Whitewood Podcast, a show about mystery schools, the occult, and witchcraft. Would you like to have a look around? Why have you come to Whitewood? Well, because I'm interested in witchcraft. I'm your host, Nate. Come with us as we delve into the history, techniques, and backstories of these traditions and the people who practice them. Welcome back to the Whitewood Podcast. My name is Nate Driscoll, and this week I wanted to create an episode where we talk about cycles. And I think that cycles make up a really interesting and fun way to delve into kind of the bigger picture and really connect a lot of these bigger grandiose ideas that we have by experimentation through symbols or through spiritual experiences or those types of things and like connect those things into our physical reality, the, the, the world that we're physically observing. And I think that cycles are a fantastic way to do that because of a couple of reasons. Number one, natural cycles make up a great deal of our world. Um, you know, you have like the seasons of time where you have like days and months and years and like this, this, the actual seasons, like the uh, spring, summer, fall, winter, seasons you have like cycles of life and death you have cycles of rebirth you have um ebbs and flows in ecosystems and in education and in societies there's all these different natural cycles that we observe in the world around us but one of the things that i think really matters is in magic uh, and, and i would say not just in magic but in a lot of spiritualities it's about connecting to the bigger picture. And so by understanding the cycles that exist in the world around us, you can kind of start to see the invisible passing of information from one thing to another that are seemingly unrelated. And cycles are easier for us to notice those in as opposed to like symbol sets. So like, for example, let's look at the seasons. Let's say you had never experienced a year. You didn't understand that there was this this uh, building up of summer and it ebbed and flowed into fall and then eventually came down into winter. If all you had ever experienced was, hey, you wake up, you go outside, it's summer. And then you wake up the next day, you went outside, it's winter. And it's like the dead of summer versus the dead of winter, right? And you had like, all you have is that. You don't have any extra framework to be able to observe those things. And you would probably assume that those were opposites. You wouldn't see them in the bigger picture. You would just say, here is summer. I have labeled it. It's super hot. Uh, everything's like dying from way too much heat, <laughs> myself included. And then there's winter where everything's dying from too much cold. And it's, you know, there's snow on the ground and there's no leaves on the trees. And it's like, they're very drastically different places. When you go to the same, the same set of the woods in the dead of summer versus the dead of winter, they're, they're like, they're like opposite places, opposite versions of that place. But via the understanding of the cycle, you understand that those opposites are actually united in one single thing, which is this flow of the seasons, right? And I think that really matters because... In magic, especially with symbol sets, when we're talking about like, we're talking about like the horoscopes or we're talking about the elements, I think the elements is probably the easiest one to, to have the conversation with. We, we know that the elements are not, oh, hey, here's this physical thing that's in the space and it made this one thing here. We know that it's like through correspondences of all these different things, uh, we can sort of see this, this category of items and experiences that are very loosely related to each other, but we understand that invisible phenomenon to all be related and that, you know, if we have too much fire energy in our life that we can mellow that out by introducing some water energy, or maybe we want to enhance it. So we add some extra fire energy things into the mix. And um, it's, it's by understanding those correspondences that these symbols become valuable. Where cycles is really interesting is because it's, it's already something that is a non-corporeal system. Non-corporeal meaning not a physical system, right? It's not like, it's like a category of days. You know, when you think about like the season moving through, it's, 
it's like, hey, any days from this date to this date, it's not each individual item. It's like a, an interrelation between these non these non physical um, correspondences between these days because of some related trait. And then um, it's also an opportunity to observe invisible phenomenon that that progression of this into that. And, and so cycles offer us a really awesome opportunity to take something which is much easier to digest and connect to the concept of invisible phenomena and non-corporeal systems. So I, I think that's a really, really big reason why cycles is so important. But I think another reason is that it tunes us with our reality in a way that's really interesting to observe the system as a whole. Instead of getting stuck in um, this equals that, and all of these things are manifestations of something going on in the background and none of this, you know, none of this is real or important. It, it, cycles exist so intricately in our physical reality that it's, it's a really interesting way to reconnect with our spirituality with that. Instead of observing things as these, I don't know, distant behind the curtain types of things, to be able to recognize them in your, in your real world, in your mundane life. So I think that's another really important reason why magicians focus so much on these cycles. These kind of cycles, they happen in the microcosm and they happen in the macrocosm. And so I wanted to kind of talk about some examples of some that are existing in both. And then eventually, a lot of these are just going to be very cut and dry. Here is a cycle that exists out there. And we're going to talk a little bit about it. Um, eventually, we're going to break the conversation down a little bit into some magical theory, some some of the more hermetic science kind of interpretations of this information and how you might use those kind of things in your magical workings, in your, let's say, just study of like, maybe you're looking at somebody else's work or maybe you're looking at a culture or... I don't know, like a, like a set of mythology or those types of things. And maybe you're trying to dig a little bit more in depth into it. I strongly suggest that if you're looking at a mythology and you're like, wow, that, that was a weird story about, you know, such and such doing this, but like, what value does that have for me? Well, zoom out a little bit. Look at the cycle that exists there. Is it, does it relate to you? Does it relate to the, to the cosmos or the world that you're in? Or, you know, can you read in between the lines a little bit and find something of meaning in there because you're, looking at the bigger picture. So that's kind of what I wanted to do. With this episode, I really wanted to dive into, you know, let's look at some micro macrocosms first. We'll work our way down to microcosm. Then we'll look at how that might get used in, um, in the occult in general. So the first one that comes to mind, and I've already used it a couple of different times, is the seasons. So there's uh, obviously... I'm, I'm sure we are all pretty aware. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a set of seasons that we've most cultures agree that there are four seasons. Our, the culture that I'm growing up in agrees there are four seasons. You could subdivide them. Um, we tend not to. We tend to leave them with four. Uh, there, there have been other cultures which perceive them as six, uh, but the four are spring, summer, fall, and winter. And they're tied to this cycle called the vernal equinox. So the vernal equinox is basically has to do with the the point in space so we know the earth rotates around the sun right and the earth's rotation is not perfectly straight up and down in relation to that rotation around the sun the planet rotates at an angle and because of the angle that it's tilted at as it moves around the sun and maintains that angle it creates seasons where depending on what side of the solar system the planet is on, we're getting hit by more or less of the sun's rays or sometimes an equal amount. It changes things just because of that angle that we're, we're at. It changes things like the day of, or the uh, length of the day. It changes things like how much um, heat is directly reaching us uh, via solar radiation. Um, and those kind of things have created natural cycles in ecosystems and in uh, the types of weather that presents itself. 
but it, it really just kind of gets tied down to that. And when I say that it's tied into the vernal equinox, what I mean by that is that there is a, a system of measuring when we are at the exact point where we receive the most of it or receive the less of it. Now, these things are going to be flipped depending on which hemisphere you're in. So if you're, you know, if you're in Australia, for example, this is going to be the opposite um, because that tilt is going to affect the top half of the planet differently than the bottom half of the planet because what is giving the most direct rays to the top half of the planet is going to make the bottom half of the planet the most far away. That's what that angle is doing, right? But basically, there are four points during the year which are of interesting significance, um, which are the solstices and the equinoxes. So the solstices, um, so oh, let's start with equinox. Equinox is an easier word. So equinox meaning equal, equal nox, nox meaning night or dark. So uh, basically what an equinox is suggesting is that the day and the night are equal lengths. And then solstices, meaning soul, uh, and I'm not sure what istis means, but uh, basically it's saying that during the two solstices, it's either the shortest or the longest day of the year, meaning there's way more daylight than nighttime or way more nighttime than daylight and that cycle has reached its peak so so the solstices happen during the summer and the winter the equinoxes happen during the spring and the fall and it lines up pretty basically with uh, which exact quadrant are you on in relation to that tilt of the earth towards or away from the sun because we rotate at an angle off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly what the angle is. If I remember correctly, it is like 23.5 degrees that were tilted in one direction. We maintain that direction, but because we're also rotating around the sun during that period, it is as if that, uh, that tilt is rotating because of how much more or less sunlight you're getting. It's a really weird thing when you're talking about these types of things because we're we're talking about them in relationship to each other. If we were only talking about the tilt, we would say that the tilt seems to rotate in comparison to the sun, but because we're talking about in relation to orbit, the orbit now, it is consistent. So we maintain that, that tilt of, if I remember correctly, it's 23.5, uh, but I would love to hear somebody correct me. <laughs> I'm really big on being corrected. <laughs> um, so that's a natural cycle that happens and it's really obvious because it our ecosystems developed over time evolved over time to respond to that so like for example there's certain animals that realize that there's not a lot of nutrients available uh, during the winter and maybe hibernation is a, a, a trait that benefited an organism enough to evolve that that trait right um Another example is like springtime, like everything blossoms and opens up in the spring because it's warm enough now that it's not going to kill the the leaves and the, the, the plant isn't going to spend a whole bunch of energy and not get a whole bunch out of it. And so they all evolved into a cycle of, you know, opening up their leaves and blossoming during the spring. And that can be a pretty magical time if, if you start to recognize um, those cycles and how the whole earth is kind of united in that procession of the seasons. Another really popular one. It's, um, oh, so the vernal equinox is basically just saying that at a specific point, uh, the, the springtime has begun based on the equinox happening, occurring during the spring where the nighttime and daytime are the equal length. So when it hits the solstice, what ends up happening is it starts changing direction. And then once it hits the equinox, it's in full flux. So the winter solstice happens when the longest night of the year has occurred. Every night up until the winter solstice, the night is getting longer. And then the days after the winter solstice, the days start getting longer, or the days start getting longer instead of the nights getting longer. So it it flips direction, whereas the equinox is a perfect equilibrium between the day and the night. Um, moon cycles 
are another example of a natural cycle that exists out in the cosmos. The moon cycle is 29.5 days. We have based a lot of stuff around the moon cycle, a lot of stuff that we don't really take credit for anymore um, is heavily tied into this. So originally this was our breakdown for the months. If you notice the word moon and uh, month, very closely, or month, very closely related. Um, it's because our idea of a 30 day month, 29.5 days for the moon cycle to complete itself. And those little half days were really hard to observe until we had certain types of astrological or measurement systems like um, what are those things called with the uh, a sextant. Yeah, that the uh, for measuring degrees in the in the sky in comparison to objects that are behind it. So until we had those kind of things, it was really hard to count them out. They seemed to be a little bit more wonky, and and it's actually kind of true that the lunar phases are not exact. Um, so there's four major lunar phases, and each one of them is approximately 7.4 days long, plus or minus 19 hours, depending on how far the moon is or close the moon is. Uh, from the Earth, because its orbit is not perfect. And so that will make a difference as we look at it. Um, there is some correlation between the moon cycles and the year. We now use a solar system for the year, but there have been lunar calendars that have existed over the years. where um, So the, the moon cycle is 29.5 days, and the major uh, lunar phases are roughly seven days, you can kind of see how you have the weeks, the length of the week and the length of the month uh, there with roughly 30 days and roughly seven days. But there's a little bit more to it because if you take the, mo uh, the moon cycle and you complete the moon cycle 12 times, uh, you end up with 354 days. And it's it's give or take a little bit. Part of that has to do with the the um, that whole plus or nineteen uh, plus or minus nineteen hours thing. Um, roughly, you're looking at if you were to like average them out, you're roughly looking at three hundred and fifty four days, eight hours, forty eight minutes, and thirty four seconds. Roughly, um, that's like the average as it as it plays out. And that was one of the reasons why it was really difficult to use lunar cycles and why I think we use solar cycles for our year now is because it's just a little bit more consistent. It's not perfect either. We'll talk about that in a second. And it leads to some interesting things about how we observe time. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that kind of gets tied into the concept of moon cycles. For example, uh, the moon is often, because of these cycles, is often related to in cultures, uh, especially magical traditions, is often considered to be a feminine energy, a goddess-like thing. And a lot of the reason is that it ties really, really closely to the average menstrual cycle. So if we stop giggling like um, middle schoolers for a moment and think about what the menstrual cycle's purpose is, you know, it's, it's this, this system that gives birth to new life and obviously the creation of new human life is, is something that we could all kind of get behind being some kind of a sacred process, right? So the average menstrual cycle is 28 days and goes through four phases. Now those phases don't perfectly line up. They are pretty damn close. Um, one of them is five days, roughly. Obviously every woman is different, but let's say we just take the averages. Uh, one of them is like five days. One of them is only a day. Uh, and then the other two kind of even, even each other out. So the four different cycles don't line up perfectly with the four major lunar cycles. However, the 28 days is pretty damn close. So you have 28 days versus 29.5 days. And that 29.5, again, is a variable. The, there have been lunar months that were as short as, in the, I want to say it was 74 I want to say it was 1974 was the shortest lunar cycle. And it was like, it was like 28.9 or something like that. The longest one will occur in 2040 something, 2042, 2045, somewhere in that range. Um, it's going to be like, I want to say it's 29.9 days. So it's like the, the whole moon cycle is just a little bit more wonky than some, some stuff because the moon is so close to us. So it's, it's small variations in distance are a lot more obvious. Um, 
But the idea of the menstrual cycle being attached to the, the moon cycle has popped up in just about every culture because they're, they're really, really close amounts of time and they, they go through certain phases. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the specific phases when we talk about magic and how the moon relates to it, but I think we all understand there's two major phases of the moon. There's the moon going all the way through the zodiac as it moves across the sky in relation to the stars that are behind it. It moves very, very quickly in comparison to all of the other objects because it is very close to us. Um, but then there's also the, the waxing and waning of the moon as it goes from a new moon, waxes up into a large, and then eventually becomes a full moon and then goes back, wanes down and becomes a new moon, new moon being where it's a dark object. You only see the dark side of the moon. And so it's a very difficult object to observe. So those are some of the types of things that get tied into the moon cycle. So we've talked about the seasons. We talked about the moon cycle. I think the sun cycle is probably a pretty obvious next step. There's multiple sun cycles. And I think the sun cycle having multiple is kind of interesting and probably one of the reasons why it gets tied into more than one concept when it comes to like the hermetic side of things, but also why it relates to mankind so well, why right? uh, the sun cycle goes through its own phase of length of day and shortness of day. But then it also has like the solar cycle of how long is the day, right? Um, when we talk about solar cycles, a lot of times we're going to be talking about the year. So we, we mentioned the moon year being 354 days and some. The solar day is 365 days, as we all know, right? Wrong. So this is this is the uh, the reason that we have leap years is that uh, it's not exact. And why would it be, right? It, it would be kind of weird if it was exact. It's pretty close to exact, but it's not exact. The day length is created by the spinning of the Earth. And the year length is created by how long it takes the Earth to spin around the sun. They're different systems, right? So they don't match up perfectly. They match up pretty close. To go around the sun one time, measuring by how many times the object rotates as it goes around, right? How many days? Is 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds. Now, if you turn that into a decimal, you get 365 point. 2422 days, roughly. There's some extra digits there if you wanted to really dive into it. And this is really important because this is why we have leap years. So if it's 365.2, it's basically 0.25, right? It's 0.2422, right? That means that the day has drifted off of our calendar once every four years. And so in order to compensate for that, we add a day to the year. And that's what the leap year is, right? It makes up for that small amount of time that gets dropped every year. Now, they first noticed this in ancient Rome, and uh, it was when they were using the Julian calendar. Eventually, they updated that to the Gregorian calendar because they realized that the seasons were no longer matching up. That And, and it, it was a while before they caught it. It was like 100 years before they caught it, and they were like, I don't understand. This, the calendar's drifting. And eventually, they calculated exactly how much they updated the calendar system, and that's why we have leap years. But leap years aren't the only jump. It, it jumps in other directions as well. So because it's not exactly 365.25 days, once every four years doesn't quite cut it, does it? We're still drifting. Now we're drifting by, you know, a couple hours every 10 years or something. I mean, it's not like a really large amount, but that adds up over time. And it has recently been a thing uh, in my lifetime where we drifted far enough that we had to do the opposite correction. So you unleap year, the year, once every, I don't remember how many years it is, I think it's like every 200 years or something, every 100 years, 200 years, there's, there's a specific number of years and you actually skip the leap year that year because that partial day has made up for it and we've been over correcting every, yeah, I think it's about 100 years. Uh, you've been overcorrecting that 0. 0.00 whatever percent, and then you have to undo it. 
So there's like leap years and then unleap years and all kind of goes into that solar cycle. The sun also goes through some other cycles though as well, right? So one of the things that happens as the sun moves through the sky is it in relation to that which is behind it. So the earth rotates, so the whole sky rotates as we rotate, right? Nothing's perfectly staying stationary. But as we rotate around the sun, what stars are behind the sun changes because the angle changes. So like if we're in the dead of summer, looking at what stars are behind the sun versus if we're in the dead of winter, pointing the other direction, looking at what stars are behind it, you can see how the sun actually goes through a cycle through the zodiac. We'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about this, the actual zodiac cycles, but um, basically the sun slowly moves through each one of the sections of the sky as we transition to the next year. There are also some eclipse cycles, which I think are really interesting. There's, there's two different kinds of eclipses. Well, there's way more kinds of eclipses. There's two major categories of eclipses. There's solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. A solar eclipse takes place when the sun is obscured and a lunar eclipse takes place in which the, the moon is obscured. And the way that that happens is that the moon is rotating around the earth and the earth is rotating around the sun. And sometimes all three objects line up in a row. And depending on which side of the earth the moon is on, you'll have either a solar or a lunar eclipse. So if it lines up where all three of them are in a row and it goes the sun and then the moon and then the earth, then standing on the earth, you would look up at the sun, the sun would be obscured by the moon because it's in the way, and you would have a solar eclipse. The exact opposite can happen where the moon goes dark and is eclipsed by the earth because the order is the sun, the earth, and then the moon, just depending on what the order of the three objects are when they line up. And so uh, there's looking at the solar side of it, the lunar side is about the same. But looking at the solar side, you have roughly two to five solar eclipses every year and a total eclipse taking place every 18 months or so. Now, that's not necessarily to say that you have a total eclipse in your physical location happening every 18 months or so. We're saying that the shadow of the moon hitting the Earth is going to happen somewhere on the planet every 18 months in, in a way where you have a total eclipse. So let's talk about total eclipses. What does that mean? So there's, there's two major types of eclipses that are solar eclipses, and then there's another thing that happens, uh, which is called a hybrid. So there's a total eclipse where we talked a little bit about how the moon cycle is very, uh, it's wonky. It's not like, it's not a perfect orbit. So sometimes the moon is closer to us, and sometimes the moon is farther away from us, depending on where that orbit is at, right? Because of that, sometimes the moon is closer to us and thus obscures the entire sun. And sometimes the moon is farther from us during an eclipse and only partially does it. We call those an annular, sometimes called a ring of fire. Basically the idea is it's not really a ring of fire, it's a ring of light poking out from the edge of the sun which was not fully obscured. So if the, if the moon is farther away from us during a solar eclipse, you can still see a ring of the sun around it. But if the moon is closer to us, it obscures more of it, right? And then there's these things called hybrids. And they happen every once in a while where, um, because of the way that the orbit is designed, designed is a weird word, because of the way that the orbit has occurred, um, it, it might catch it at just that peak of its orbit where it's starting to become closer or farther from us. And you can actually have a hybrid where it changes what type of eclipse is happening during the eclipse. It's, it's not very common. It does happen where, like, for example, you could have an eclipse where it starts off as a ring of fire, transitions into a total, and theoretically even transitions back. It's a very interesting time window that can happen. Um, but that's the basic idea. And then there's also, like, weird stuff that can happen with uh, the angle. Where like maybe three quarters of it is eclipsed based on where you're standing. But if you were to travel, you know, 500 miles south or something like that, you might find that 
it was actually a total eclipse to that area. So some of that kind of stuff can come into play. But there's a, there's a cycle to the eclipses. It just has to do with the timing of all these objects rotating around each other. We're definitely going to talk more about those two things when we do an astrology episode. Um, I think it would be pretty important. Another one that ties heavily into astrology is the zodiac cycles. So the zodiac cycles is where you have the sun moving through the zodiac, um, as we said. It's not a perfect system. So what we mean by that is that the first time it was observed, the uh, they started measuring it on the vernal equinox. Remember, that's the the first day of, or the the yeah the first day of spring. That's the period where you have an equinox that happens in the sun, equal day and equal night during the uh, during the spring. Um, so they started in ancient times recording it then, and it was so close to perfect they didn't actually notice that it was off. It wasn't until a while later, I mean hundreds of years later, where one astrologer referenced the work of another astrologer and found that they had lost a couple of degrees, that it wasn't exact, that they even realized these two systems weren't, uh, that they were drifting away from each other. And and it kind of makes sense because one of them is created from the rotation, one of them is created from the object going around the sun. We talked a little bit about that in solar cycles, it's that 0.24 days or whatever caused a huge issue where the calendars were drifting. So that creates two separate cycles Number one being the sun moving through the zodiac, but then number two, what's called the precession of the equinox. So this was first discovered by uh, Hippocaris in 129 BC. And he was referencing uh, Timocaris um, from 273 BC. So, I don't know, 130 years, something like that. I'm not going to do the math, but... 130, 140 years earlier to him, someone had documented the position of specific stars, specific objects on the equinox. And they discovered that it was like drifting because it's not a perfect system. Because those two things aren't necessarily related, which creates this new cycle. So if you think about the vernal equinox happens at the beginning of spring, and then whatever stars the sun is at when that starts, if this, if whatever symbol that is in drifts slowly, I think it's like one degree every 30 years or something like that. And there's 30 degrees in a, in a Zodiac, the way that we do it now, there's, we'll talk about that in an astrology episode. There's more than one way to do, um, astrology. Um, in the, in the evenly divided version. There's 30 degrees in each zodiac. Um, what that means is that there's this long-term motion where the vernal equinox itself actually, and the, the year itself, actually slowly drifts throughout the stars. You've probably heard this if you've ever looked at, like, some of those websites that are just trying to get you excited all the time, where they're like, oh my god, astrologers have discovered that if you're actually a Leo, you're not a Leo anymore, you're really this. This is what they're talking about. They're talking about how slowly the years uh, in relation to, to the sky s just adjusts like a degree every 30 years. And thus, over a period of, to go through each zodiac, it takes like 2,150 years. That's what the actual number is. It's 2,150 years to go through from one zodiac to the next zodiac, to the same position in the next zodiac. So if we say, if we say five degrees in this one, for it to get to five degrees in the next one, is 2150 years. Now this is really really interesting if you're into if you're into magic and you're into history and you're into especially if you're a thelemite where you're into like the thelemic stuff. Um, this is the aeons. This is the the amount of time that it takes for, you know, a culture to go through its full spiritual revival. Think about what happened about 2000 years ago, you know, you're looking at like Christ and about 2000 years before that, you're looking. So you've got like these long-term uh, societal changes that happen during these long periods of time uh, to go all the way through this in, this drift it takes 
25,000 years, 20, almost 26, it's 25,800 years to go through this entire drift. Um, and I, it's not something that we talk about a whole lot. Uh, it is one of those things where a lot of people will claim like, oh yeah, well, we'll probably get similar stuff happening within similar periods. So if we had this profit happen exactly 2,150 years ago, we'll probably have another profit of, you know, of a certain number of greatness, a certain amount of greatness happen exactly in the next periods. It's usually considered to be these large epics, these large, you know, aeonic systems uh, as we progress through these large, what's called the procession of the equinox. It was first observed hundreds of, or thousands of years ago, but it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's something we don't talk about a whole lot. Um, there's a bigger one. There's one that's larger. There's one, I'm sure there's one we haven't become aware of yet. Uh, space is very large, but we know for a fact there is at least one more that relates to specifically our planet. It's called the galactic cycle. The galactic cycle is basically that our entire solar system is also rotating around an object. So we're rotating around the sun. The sun is rotating around the supermassive black hole. It's at the middle of the Milky Way. And it orbits the center of that, goes all the way around the circle over time. It's not a stationary object, but it moves It moves very, very fast. It's just a very, very large object. So it's, it's moving... The sun is moving around the solar system at like 8,000, no, it's, it's about 828,000 kilometers an hour. Uh, it's really fast, but it's such a large amount of space that it takes 230 million years to make a full, uh, complete orbit around the Milky Way. So it doesn't really have a whole lot of value for like human beings, because, you know, when you think about like, like where the zodiac cycles and the procession of the equinox, well, human beings were around 2,000 years ago and around 4,000 years ago and around 6,000 years ago. So, like, we've gone through several of the zodiac cycles. That one is, like, observable to us. Um, we, have mod we, like, have history of those periods. So it's interesting to look at the patterns as they relate to the zodiac cycle and the procession of the equinox. But the galactic cycle is not as valuable to us because we're talking about, like, life on Earth type cycles. So, like, 230 million years, right? So, if you cut that in half, uh, 115 million years ago, you can kind of see, like, the objects that would... The, the amount of... The types of life that occurred on the opposite side of the galaxy is very drastically different than this side. And um, I'm not sure if anybody's ever really, like, tried to dig through and look at um, hey, life went through these cycles on this side every single time that it was there. I don't, I don't know that anybody's bothered, but we have gone all the way through it several times since there has been life on Earth. Um, the T Rex, for example, occurred on the opposite side of the galaxy from us. Stegosaurus was closer to our side of the galaxy. So if you ever see like those, uh, those like images of you know like when they're getting kids really riled up about dinosaurs and they're like, learn about dinosaurs. These are cool. And they, they have like a, like a T-Rex fighting a Stegosaurus. It's like the classical dinosaur image. Those things were separated by millions of years and were on opposite sides of the galaxy. Like if you look at like the, what side of the galaxy human beings are on versus dinosaurs, we are way closer to Stegosaurus's, uh, like geogra it's not geographically galactographically i don't know what the word is there uh but you know like the physical distance between us and where they occurred is much smaller than between t-rexes and stegosaurus just fun facts probably not important to magic but you can see something as we look through all this which is that number one these cycles are intrinsically everywhere they are in the very very small like the budding of a leaf on a tree they're in the very, very large, like the evolutionary cycle of, uh, of extinction and, and re-evolution uh, via the system of life as it moves around the galaxy. They're in our day-to-day -day as you see the sun rise and set every single day, rising in the east, setting in the west, and then continuing again. They are in... Uh, they're also in you. You know, these cycles are also in you. There's this system of life and death and rebirth that 
uh, occurs within your life. Now, I don't want to make a bold claim to say that no one will ever not die. Technology is interesting. Uh, I'm sure in hundreds of years, there could potentially be some type of technology that would enable us to uh, extend our lives, or at least our consciousnesses, to what we might consider to be forever. We'd have to redefine what we consider to be forever. I don't know. I don't know. If you if you upload your brain into a computer and you put that computer running in the middle of nowhere where it won't interact with any objects, d does that constitute eternal life? I I'm not sure. You know, that's I, definitely a philosophical hole. I don't want to dive down. I will say, however, everyone that's listening to this episode after I release it is probably going to die <laughs> at some point. Not tomorrow, uh, hopefully, but uh, eventually you will. You'll, you'll, you'll probably pass on. And so there's this natural cycle that is in you where uh, you start off as this, you know, um, small, infinitesimally small moment of ecstasy. And then you become an infant and a child. A child goes through adolescence and puberty, eventually becoming a teenager and then a young adult. And then an adult probably creates the next version of the cycle, but not always, you know, a lot of times creates the next infant uh, somewhere in the young adult to adult phase, some as early as the teen, I suppose. Uh, and then eventually becomes elderly uh, and goes through the experience of death. Death is one of the only things that I think is, for the most part, guaranteed. Pending any technological advancements that drastically change our understanding of the universe, you are going to die. It's one of the only things that is guaranteed to you. But life is also going to continue on without you because of this natural cycle of life, death, and rebirth. And um, I don't think it's just in us that these cycles happen. Societies themselves go through cyclic changes. We see over and over in history. They say they say if you if you um, those who are what is the exact quote? Those who are those who refuse to study history are doomed to repeat it. Something along those lines. I don't remember the exact quote. Um, but there's this cyclic change that happens in societies as well, where groups that were once the most moral thing that existed. So basically there's the old, it resists change. Something new breaks out of the mold because the old way is no longer moral in comparison. We've learned so much over hundreds and thousands of years that these things are no longer appropriate. And uh, new groups emerge. And those new groups eventually become immoral in that they are limited. And if you get too stuck in your ways, you uh, cannot adapt and change with the coming times, with the new philosophies, the new learnings, the new experiences that exist. And so eventually it leads to more resistance of the new. And a new uh, ideology uh, will be born and resist, break out of the resistance of the old morality. And we see this cyclic change happen throughout societies. Some of them were um, recorded long enough that we got to see them go through different kinds of changes. Like there are, there are some societies where like there are two groups um, heavily tied to like religious concepts, political parties, those kind of things. And one is very moral and upstanding and the other has been around for a really long time and held power and starts to become decrepit and, and oppressive. And then they'll overpower it, but then they're in a position where there's nothing to fight. And so they, they, they sit down and rest for a while and then they become decrepit. <laughs> and then the other one, you know, comes back. And this, sometimes we see these cycles in societies where it's like two actual parties. And sometimes it's not, sometimes it's just this, um, like philosophical concept bursting out of the problems that were created by the last one. Um, we definitely see like those types of things with like the Renaissance where it's not necessarily like one of two groups, but it's this new ideology that gets born out of uh, bursting out of everything that was wrong with, uh, you know, that period, the dark ages. Um, 
So those are some examples of some cycles that exist out there. There are some magical cycles as well that are worth mentioning. They're worth taking a look at. Um, many of them are related to some of the things that I just brought up. I really tried to do something weird that I don't usually do with this one, which was look almost solely at the scientific reason for this for the first 45 minutes of an episode. This, this, you know, And I hope that it was interesting to listen to enough that you made it this far in the episode because a lot of it was just like numbers being shot at you and like pointing out, hey, did you notice that the tilt of the earth in the moon cycle, 29.5 and 365.2422? And you know, I get it. Like I, I do, I understand. But it was, it was important to understand that like some of these are related to each other loosely some of them are completely separated from each other but we kind of take them in together and some of them have this interesting depth to it that we didn't realize was there like the procession the equinox those kind of things right but now i want to talk about the actual magical cycles that i think are worth looking into the number one one that i see referenced in old grimoires and not talked about enough in modern time is the planetary hours. I think it's really, really interesting. Um, so the, there's the days of the week. Days of the week are associated with specific planetary energies. And then there's also um, the hours of the day are associated with specific planetary energies. Now, when we talk about planetary energies as we're relating to hermetic science, we're talking about the f observable objects which move at different rates in the sky so we include the sun and the moon obviously the sun and the moon are not planets but they are observable objects that are in the sky we also cut out the planets which are beyond physical observance because these types of things were discussed and the associations and correspondences were drawn before the invention of the telescope and so um like uranus neptune pluto uh those types of objects don't get included um so when i say the seven planets uh, i'm talking about the sun the moon mercury venus um mercury venus mars jupiter saturn so those are the objects that we see moving on the backdrop of the stars that can be observed with the naked eye um there's seven days of the week seven alchemical stages the seven planets those are really really related concepts so as we look at this recognize that's on purpose those are definitely developed those ideas were developed together uh the symbols were developed together and explored together and so they overlap quite a bit um so i'm going to break down the days of the week first and how each of the days of the week is interesting then we're going to talk about the planetary hours. So first off, the days of the week are named after a combination of the planetary bodies themselves or um, it's usually Norse, Norse or Scandinavian mythology. Um, some, some gods in those uh, make their way into the system. So Sunday, obviously, that one's pretty easy. It's the day of the sun, Sunday, right? Uh, another really obvious one is Monday, Moon Day, Monday, right? Uh, Saturday, Saturn Day, it's the day of Saturn. Um, those are the easy ones. Now we get to the ones that are a little less obvious. Uh, so Friday is, is Frigg, Frigg's Day. Uh, Thor's Day, Thor, the god Thor, Thunder, Hammer. Uh, that would be Thursday. Um... Woden, there's a reason why Wednesday is not spelled W-E-N-S-D-A-Y, is because it's not Wednesday, it's Wednesday, it's Woden's Day. So Odin was sometimes pronounced Woden, depending on what culture, uh, different Germanic systems of pronunciation for Odin. Um, another common god in their pantheon was Tyr, which is Tuesday, Tyr's Day. It's pretty easy once somebody points it out to notice them. Uh, but we don't talk about it anymore. It's kind of weird. So some of these are really, really obvious. They're like, gee, I wonder what planet is associated with Sunday. That's hard. Uh, is it the sun? 
yay, you got it, right? Uh, some of them are a little more complicated where you're like, what about Thor? Which one is Thor? Well, modernly, we would associate Thor with like probably Mars type energies, but they kind of, in ancient times, associated Thor with being a little bit more of the Jupiter character. Uh, if you were not like a king, you were not worshiping Odin as the top of that pantheon. It, most people were worshiping Thor as the main god. So, uh, so uh, Thursday gets associated with Jupiter. Um, Woden was, you know, associated with his travels as he went out into the world and looked for wisdom. He's associated with wisdom, of course. Uh, so Wednesday, Woden's day, gets associated with uh, Mercury. Um, Tyr has some epic tales of him being related to certain kinds of things uh, like losing his hand and uh, battling Fenrir, those kind of things uh, so he gets Mars um, and then Frigg is the wife of Odin so she it gets associated with you know, some of those feminine qualities that we might consider to be present in um, in like the Venus energies so just going down the list Saturday, Saturn, Sunday, Sun, Monday, Moon, uh, Tuesday, Mars, Wednesday, Mercury, Thursday, Jupiter, Friday, Venus. So those are the associations there. Now, this is a really, really interesting thing to look at as we transition into planetary hours. I'm going to kind of read it off. It's not going to make a whole lot of sense until you take an actual opportunity to like write it down or these are available online. You can easily just Google out planetary hours. Uh, and find, man, there's a chart that's fantastic. It's on Wikipedia. Like these are very easily available for people who want to uh, go take a look at them. Um, so there's this, there's this prog. What's the, I don't, I don't want to say procession because it's not a procession. There's, there's a, there's a cycle of, there's an order of objects cycling through these planetary energies, which is called the Chaldean order. Now it was first developed and theorized by Pythagoras and then later by the Babylonians as they were looking at Pythagoras's work. Pythagoras laid out some of the basics for the numerology. The Babylonians associated that numerology to astrology. And basically what it does is it lays out this, this order by observing the physical planets as they move through the sky. The slowest moving ones moving up to the fastest moving ones according to the naked eye and how fast they're moving within the zodiac right so the one that moves the slowest is saturn and then going from saturn it goes to jupiter and then to mars that makes sense those ones are the farthest away from us in that order right saturn is the farthest out that you can see with your naked eye jupiter is the next one out and then mars is the next one out uh makes sense that they moved it about that right then comes the sun, and that just has to do with how fast we go around the uh, the earth, or the earth goes around the sun. How fast we go around the sun makes the illusion of the sun moving through the zodiac. And so that one comes up next. Um, and then Venus, Mercury also makes sense. Those are the ones that are closest to the sun in those orders. And then finally, the moon it rotates around us instead of this other stuff. And so it moves very, very quickly in comparison to all of the other planets. And so that's what's called Chaldean order. There's a couple of other ways to order out planetary energies. Uh, if you look at like Kabbalistic stuff or the spheres of the planets, or the, there's like, uh, there's a lot of systems that, that, but the planetary energies in specific are based off of Chaldean order, which is how fast are they moving? So, if you take a day and you start it at sunrise and you end it at sunset, now remember, the sunrise and sunset changes length all the time, changes what time that's happening. Unless you're at an equinox, it's not going to be perfectly even. And uh, that's the only time that these are going to be exact hours, 60 minute hours is during those equinox periods. Uh, so most of the time, it's not going to be 60 minute hours, but you're just taking sunrise to sunset, dividing it up into 12 equal pieces. On the equinox, it's 60 minutes. Otherwise, it might be an hour and a half. It might be less, right? Um, 
And then starting, we're going to start with Saturday to make this a little bit more obvious why it's going through this progression. So Saturday starts going through Chaldean order. The first hour is the hour that that day is associated with, which is Saturn, right? Chal Chaldean order would then go to Jupiter and then Mars. So the second hour and the third hour are Jupiter and Mars. And then the fourth hour is associated with the sun and so on and so forth until you get all the way to the 24th hour, right? If you progress all the way through that and then to the 24th hour, and then just keep going with the cycle of Chaldean order. So the last hour of the day of Saturday is going to be Mars because of that. If you just go on to the next hour, according to Chaldean, what's after Mars? Sun. So Saturday then gives way to Sunday. So this breakdown of these objects, it's, uh, you just keep reading through. You just start on Saturday. You start on any day that you want to. First hour is just whatever's associated with that day. And then each one of those hours is associated. Now, how would you use that magically, right? Um, well, it depends on what you want to do. Um, let's say you're doing a working towards Mercury and you're trying to empower some kind of Mercury talisman. It would be smart to try to get it as much empowered as physically possible by specifically that energy. So you might potentially say to yourself, I'd like to do it on a Wednesday because Wednesday is um, a good day for it. Now, if making that talisman is going to take you longer than an hour, or maybe it's going to take you five hours, you might just choose to do it on Wednesday. And you might choose to do it on a Wednesday where Mercury is in the sky. Mercury is a really easy an example for that because its orbit is so small that as long as the sun is high in the sky, Mercury is probably in the sky as well, even though you can't see it. Um, but that might be a potential way to do it. Maybe looking more at Mars, you want Mars to be in the sky, you might pick a day like Tuesday. Uh, but then you might also say, hey, I'm working this weird energy where it's kind of Mars-like, but it also is kind of Moon-like. How can I have some Moon energy and some Mars energy at the same time? Well, maybe you choose to do Monday instead, so you have that Moon energy, and then you pick the fourth hour of the day so that you have that, you know, Mars energy that's in there. Maybe it's something like that. Maybe you want it like super, super, super Mercury energy. So you're going to pick Wednesday. You're going to go at the eighth hour. You're going to make sure that the sun is high in the sky. So it's physically in the sky. All three of those are all hit at that point. And uh, maybe you have a whole year to prepare for this working. And so you chose like a specific time of year that is also associated with that cycle. So you could see how you could pick like a best case. And now am I saying like, don't ever make a Mercury uh, talisman on any other date? No, of course not. No. Um, but the more observation you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. So like maybe like a best case is to do it at Wednesday in the eighth hour, uh, when it's in the sky and you know, when there's zodiac alignments. Sure. But could you also do it, you know, on a Sunday at 3 PM? Sure. Why not? Who cares? It's just going to get, you're just going to get more out of it. That's another thing. We're going to talk about the moon cycles. A lot of people get stuck on the moon cycles, especially when they first get started where they're like, well, how am I, I need to do this working now, but the moon cycle's not right for it. Now, what do I do? Do, do your working. It's fine. You know, best case is to try to cycle up with certain cycles, but you don't have to. Uh, it's just going to empower your working a little bit more, right? Another thing that's very similar to the planetary energies is the tatva hours. The Tattva hours are an Indian system for elemental hours. They're two hours long, and they start in spirit and then go through a specific order. So they start spirit, and then they go air, fire, water, earth. And they cycle through that until you get to the next day. Um, so you could feasibly try to psych cycle up with elemental energies as well. Something to note here... Um, if you have ever practiced LBRP as it is written, the Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram, uh, the if you start the ritual at the east, like it says to, and then you go around the circle clockwise, like it says to, you'll go through air, fire, water, earth in that order. It's the top of hours. So you start at air, then you go to fire, then you go to water, and then you go to earth. LBRH, Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Hexagram, does the exact same thing with the elements, but 
has different quadrants for them and everyone gets really confused as to why, it's because it's also referencing a cycle. It's referencing a cycle that exists within the horoscopes. So there's a, there's um, elemental associations to each one of the horoscopes. And uh, LBRH, Lesser Branching Orange with Hexagram, starts uh, in the east with fire and then in the south with earth and then air, water. So if you look at Aries as a fire sign, Taurus, the bull, is an earth sign, Gemini, always equating multiple ideas is an air sign cancer is a water sign cancer is the crab right uh, and then it cycles back into leo leo being a fire sign so um this is a perfect example of two things number one you might choose to use tatva hours in order to do elemental works the same way you would do planetary hours for your planetary works right that's a potential but then you could also write your rituals to kind of adore these types of progression systems so, like, you might, if you were the person writing LBRP for the first time, you might go, hmm, I'm trying to do some kind of an elemental thing that has to do kind of taught with hours. Oh, here's this pattern. I could put this pattern into the ritual. So, like, that might be a potential way to use cycles in a way that we know people have been doing for a long time. A lot longer than just LBRP's been around. Um, waxing, waning, and... Or the waxing and waning moon cycles. Another perfect example. You might try to... Uh, sync your, let's say you have a whole month to prepare, 29.5 days to prepare. <laughs> um, you could pick to do your ritual on a specific night that is empowered and emboldened by whichever part of the moon cycle is in, right? So like, for example, waxing moon is when every night the moon's, the amount of the moon that is lit up is getting bigger because it's moving towards the full moon. And so to do something in a waxing moon would be great for building up certain types of energies. Maybe you're like opening a new business. Maybe you're, um, I don't know, doing some kind of thing where you're trying to build yourself up. Waning, exact opposite. Waning moons would be really, really great for breaking down things, letting go of things that you're trying to get rid of, right? Breaking them down. Because every night the moon gets a little darker. The new moon is great for like secret workings, new things, initiatory works, uh, shadow work, um, new beginnings. We're going to start some new epic cycle in our lives. Uh, new moon's great for that. And then the full moon is awesome for just that grandiose brilliance that is the moon being so bright that it lights up the whole world. It's like the, the full empowerment of the lunar cycle. And so depending on what you wanted to do, you, you could, if you wanted to, select a specific night of the month to do your working that matches up with this cycle. Again, just like the planetary energies, it's really important to not get super stuck in this. Don't be like, I need to do this ritual right now and I can't because the moon's not right. Just go ahead and do your ritual. Just know that if you had 30 days to prepare and you were you know, putting in the extra effort and thinking to yourself, hmm, how could I do this? Select a day where the moon cycle or the planetary hour is uh, appropriate. It should help you out. Zodiac. Very similar concept, uh, using the zodiacs to do uh, specific rituals during specific zodiac cycles. So, for example, let's say we're doing a ritual to Set, the horned god from. Uh, he's the um, what do you call it? Ad ad adversary? Yeah, he's the adversary in the Egyptian pantheon. He's one of the adversaries in the Egyptian pantheon. Depends on the period of the Egyptian pantheon. It's a very long, couple thousand years. <laughs> um, but for example, Set, the horned god that is the uh, bad guy to Osiris. Um, maybe you're doing a ritual that's Setian. And it would make sense to do it during Capricorn, which is, you know, number one, part of the dark part of the year. Number two, it's uh, a horned, it's a goat. Like this, the symbol of Capricorn is a goat. So it kind of has some set vibes going on, you know? Maybe you wanted to do like something to Hercules. You know, maybe you're doing like some kind of like like epic ritual play that's you know supposed to go through the the Herculean triumph over the lion, and maybe you choose the zodiac of the Leo. The, you know, Leo is the lion, and you could you know potentially do something to uh, that particular mythology and that particular story, incorporate that in, but choose to do it during a specific zodiac because the symbols are very similar. Whether that's the interpretations of the symbols. Or that that's the physical symbol of the lion itself being part of Hercules wrestling the lion. So there's a lot of options here when it comes to how could I take advantage of a specific cycle. The solstices are really, really popular for this. Um, 
the especially especially in like more witchcraft oriented stuff as opposed to the, like the hermetic side of stuff i see them really cling on to the solstices the uh the eight different holidays in the wheel of the year in the wiccan traditions the pagan traditions are directly related to the solstices and equinoxes themselves and then the middle point that's exactly in between those they have eight of them there's four solar events they have a midway point for each that's their four holidays or their eight holidays that's what they are right and they write rituals that are you know oriented around these passing of the seasons that they celebrate on these specific solar days and so you can kind of see how uh, maybe as the season is transitioning from, you know, summer to, uh, what is summer going to? Summer to fall. Uh, maybe you write some kind of a celebration of the passing of that one god's energy into the next god. And you can kind of see how that ties into, like, mythology. And um, finally, to talk about the last bit of cycles, I think it's really important to understand is uh, mythology and magical formula. So let's say we're sitting down looking at a specific ritual, looking at a specific mythology from a culture, trying to dig into the deeper side of it. We might look for these types of cycles, um, whether it's the specific ones we've been talking about or whether it's other ones. Uh, we might look at how these cycles present themselves over and over and over again. One example of a magical formula that is a cycle is the EAO formula. The ELO formula is uh, the letter I, A, and then O. Now, uh, the Golden Dawn did some work where they expand a little bit on this concept. So ELO is a word that's taken from Greek, and then they kind of expanded it in some other ideas. They looked at it in relationship to Christianity. They looked at it in relationship to the Egyptian pantheons. They looked at it in relationship to the Greek pantheons, and they found some similarities. Uh, a similar cycle was being adored in all of them. And they just kind of tied them all into this idea. And that's a pretty common thing with magical formula. And I'm not going to get a whole deep into like what are magical formula and how might you use them and all those kind of things. Because I think that's a whole episode in itself. But I wanted to show the cycle that exists specifically in the EO formula. So the way they break it down is they break it down as Isis, Apophis, Osiris. Uh, it's e, uh, oh. I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing E. Uh, it's pronounced E-O it's, it's spelled I-A-O so I for Apophis A for, or I'm sorry I for Isis, A for Apophis O for Osiris um, so this concept of um, the mother goddess Isis giving birth to um, Horus via the destruction of Osiris, her husband of, from Apophis's triumphant or Set's triumphant depending on how you view it Typhon's triumphant um, action of murdering the old god which then leaves a space for the new god to take place. It's often related to the solar cycle of the birth of the uh, beginning of the day and then the, uh, the triumph of the destroyer and then the rebirth of the new god in the place of the old god and uh being like the sun is born then the sun sets the sun has now died it's gone now the world is consumed by night apophis has won and now the world is consumed in darkness and then via this vehicle of this cycle the sun is born again and the, and the next day is born and it being not necessarily different, but not necessarily the same. It is a separate day, but it is also. And there's a lot more to this. I'm just pointing out just the cycle that exists here. If you're interested in Magical Formula EO, definitely one of the more interesting ones. There's a lot of information there. I am slimming all of that out because we're literally just talking about cycles right now. Another one, uh, the yod heh vov -Hey formula, uh, the, which is sometimes referred to as the Tetragrammaton. The yod heh vov -Hey formula, each one of those letters is associated uh, in a lot of Crowley's work when he talks about uh, magical formulas. He'll talk about the, um, the king and queen, the prince and princess. Each one of the letters, the, the yod and the he, and then the vav and the he, j and i and j and v, 
um, very, very closely related linguistically. And then hey and hey, you can see how those are very close to each other because it's the same letter. <laughs> so it's this concept of like um, the elevation of the prince and princess via their assuming the throne. So the king and the queen give birth to the prince who then finds a princess and then they become the king and queen who then give birth to a son who then finds a princess who then you see there's a cycle there as well um again just like the elo formula i am incredibly truncating this down uh almost to the point of bastardizing it uh by oversimplifying it and uh if you're into magical formula, there's a whole bunch of it. There is probably more information about the yod hey vor vav hey formula than there is about the EIO formula, um, which is saying a lot because a lot of stuff goes back to the EIO one. So you can see how in those types of things, uh, there's a cycle present. Um, there's also a cycle in the mythologies that they are representing. So like in the EIO, um, you have... Isis gives birth to Horus, who is then takes the throne of Osiris, who was slain by uh, Apophis. You can see that dying god concept of you know passing the passing the throne to the next. Um, another s f common one: Christ in the tomb, the the slain god concept of Christ in the tomb. Um, basically, what ends up happening is Christ goes about his travels. He tells everybody that they should be nice to each other and love each other always a bad idea uh <laughs> if you want to get people to kill you that's probably the fastest way <laughs> and uh then you know he uh gets crucified uh they put him in a tomb he sits in the tomb for three days and then he rises up and is resurrected this is directly corresponding to uh the solar cycle um christmas happens um december 25th so Christmas is um, often related to a, a Jesus day. They say Christ is born on December 25th. Uh, it, it's a little bit more interesting if you look at it as the rebirth happens on the 25th, the death happening on 25th, because December 25th is the day where the sun stops moving through the zodiac. So the, the, because the angle is changing, the, the actual solstice, the winter solstice happens on the 20... I want to say the 21st. But on the 25th... No, I think 25th is the longest night of the year. And then there's three days where the sun doesn't change direction yet. So basically, like, the sun holds its position at both points as as the day starts to round out a little bit more. And so that starts on... Yeah, so it's the 20, 21st, 2nd third fourth yeah fifth so it's the 21st is the solstice that's the darkest night of the year is the 21st usually then the 20 second third and fourth are the th the three days of the sun staying within that position at the far point of the darkest at which point the 25th is the first day where light starts to return it's the first day where the day is longer than it was the day before. So there's this natural cycle of the Christ story associating with December 25th that has to do with um, the solar cycle. Obviously, there's some other stuff in the cycle that is, um, you know, his birth, life, death, and then resurrection uh, being solar in an aspect you'll often hear people say like oh the story of horus is the same story a lot of that goes back to exactly what we're talking about the O formula um you know uh, osiris is slain takes his place as the god of the dead and then his son is him reborn via the vehicle of isis impregnating herself with his semen uh and then giving birth to horus as the sun god so osiris was the sun god he dies apophis is triumphant and then the new god the child god uh, is reborn in his image, Christ and Horus being closely related. So you can kind of see, based on some of those conversations, how magical formula are often cycles. 
how mythology are often cycles, and how often some of their symbols are very, very similar, and how those can relate very closely to some of the uh, very scientific cycles that we were talking about earlier with solar and seasons, stuff like that. So I hope this episode has been of benefit to a lot of people. And, uh, you know, good luck. Thanks for listening to the Whitewood Podcast. This show is made possible by our Patreon members. You can find us on Twitter at Whitewood Show and on Facebook at Whitewood Podcast. For links to all our social media and information about our Patreon, visit us at whitewoodpodcast.com.